This is Creepy, a podcast dedicated to sharing the most famous, chilling, and disturbing creepy pastas and urban legends in the world. Whether these stories truly happened or are simply fabrications is for you to decide. These stories may contain graphic depictions of violence and explicit language. Listener discretion is advised. Creepy presents Bonnie the Beaver Goes to Church Written by Ryan Peacock I grew up in a very, very Christian household. My parents were die-hard Bible thumpers, and they still are to this day. You know how most kids grew up with Disney and DreamWorks? Yeah, I got none of that. The TV was for worship only, and most of the time it was tuned to some local channel that broadcast and rebroadcast sermons from the local megachurch. The few times I was allowed to use it for anything other than watching sermons, I got my pick of some of those old Christian animated movies. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Small budget, poorly made crap that exists just to regurgitate the same watered-down Christian morals to impressionable kids. Some of it at least tries to rip off a more credible movie, like Finding Jesus as opposed to Finding Nemo. Others just recap Bible stories like Joshua and the Promised Land. You won't find many that try to be original, and those that are are usually the worst offenders. Christian animation has developed an infamous reputation in recent years. In no small part, thanks to internet content creators dredging it up from the obscure depths to point and laugh. I'm not looking to offend anyone when I say this, but some of it probably deserves to be mocked. Look, I get that most of it was someone's passion project to bring Jesus to the youth of America, by riding the coattails of Veggie Tales, but it all feels so incredibly shallow and disingenuous, on top of generally looking like absolute garbage. I've mostly stepped away from religion, so maybe I'm a harsher critic of it than most. But anyone who says they're doing God's work by making a kid's cartoon, and not spending that time and money actually trying to find ways to help those in need, seriously has their priorities skewed. If YouTubers want to crucify those movies for content these days, that's fine by me. Honestly, it's one part nostalgic and one part cathartic to watch someone rip them apart. I won't name all the classics. You can find most of them on YouTube, and there's nothing I can say that others haven't already. But if a YouTuber has picked it apart, I probably own a copy as a child. Well, I'll accept one. See, there's one film I've never seen anybody cover. It's called Bonnie the Beaver Goes to Church. Out of all the bad Christian movies I've seen, It's the only one that legitimately gave me nightmares as a kid. So, I guess since nobody else is talking about it, I decided to do it myself. Why not, right? Bonnie the Beaver Goes to Church was released in March of 2006. It was the first and only feature-length film released by Trinity Pictures Animation. The film was released with little fanfare directly to DVD and was not distributed by any major retail chains, mostly being found in the bargain band of independently owned dollar stores, convenience stores, and Christian bookstores, amongst other places. As a result, it's extremely rare to come across a copy of the film today, and it's estimated that fewer than 500 copies were ever made. The blurb on the back promises kids... A lesson in the importance of maintaining your relationship with God that the whole family can enjoy. And the art cover depicted the titular Bonnie the Beaver in her yellow shirt and purple skirt, standing before a crudely animated church and waving at the viewer. I couldn't tell you where to get your hands on a copy today. The only reason I have one is because I swiped it the last time I visited my parents. It was still nestled in with her modest DVD collection. Almost entirely forgotten about, and I doubted they'd miss it. 
Then, when I got home, I popped it into my laptop and gave it another wash to see how well I remembered it. It was, well, it was just as bad, if not worse, than I remembered. On the surface, the film has all the hallmarks of similar independent Christian animated films of the time. The animation is notoriously poor, with most characters moving in a stiff and robotic manner. The eyes never seem to move or blink, and the movements of the characters' mouths don't sync up with their dialogue most of the time. The voice acting was done by inexperienced actors, and at several points in the film, outside noise is picked up by the recordings. At one point early in the film, a lawnmower can be heard in the background every time Bonnie's father speaks, having been picked up by the voice actor's microphone. The film also doesn't have much of a plot and is fairly short, with a runtime just shy of 60 minutes. What little plot there is goes as follows. The film opens with an unimpressive panning shot of an empty neighborhood filled with colorful blocky houses. An upbeat soundtrack plays as the title fades into view before fading out. No actors are credited, and the camera zooms towards Bonnie the Beaver's window to find her asleep in her bed. Her mother, a grossly fat and malformed looking thing, enters her room. The bedroom door opens silently, and her mother's legs do not appear to be moving. She tells Bonnie to wake up because it's time for church. I'll warn you up front, the dialogue in this movie is just about as stiff as it gets. Naturally, Bonnie complains that she doesn't want to go to church, and then her dad comes in and tells her that they have to go to church. Unsurprisingly, this dialogue is incredibly stiff and poorly written. The audio quality for each voice actor is different, making it clear that all the lines were recorded in different rooms. There's also very little inflection or change in the parents' voice actors' tones. However, Bonnie herself is nearly unintelligible. Her voice actress is clearly a very young child of about three or four with no prior acting experience. It can be difficult to make out what she's saying at times. The poor audio quality does not help the situation. The parents tell Bonnie to get dressed before gliding backwards out of her room, and Bonnie rises up from her bed fully clothed. The next few minutes of the film are uneventful, with Bonnie watching her parents get ready for church. All this really amounts to is her father giving her a lengthy and somewhat rambling speech about how important it is to have a relationship with God, so that one may enter heaven. Incidentally, this is about where one could hear the lawnmower in the background of his dialogue. Eventually they leave the house and walk down an empty street. They pass a park that consists of a large green hill with a single tree and three characters underneath it. Bradley the Bull, Marty the Mouse, and Ronnie the Rhino. It's somewhat clear at a glance what Bradley and Marty are. Bradley has large horns similar to that of a bull, and Marty has mouse ears. Ronnie, on the other hand, has no rhino features aside from being gray. One wouldn't actually know she was meant to be a rhino unless you read the back of the box. She just appears to be nothing more than a gray little girl in an ugly red and white polka dot dress. As Bonnie passes the field with the tree, her three friends run up to the white picket fence separating them and ask her if she wants to join them outside to play. Bonnie sadly tells them that she can't, because she has to go to church and is dragged away by her parents looking just about as dejected as a poorly animated cartoon beaver can look. In the next scene they arrive at the church and are seated in a pew, but Bonnie still looks unhappy. She looks around and then whispers to her mother that she has to go to the bathroom. So, of course, her mother lets her go, and Bonnie is next seen jogging out of the church and snickering to herself. The sound of snickering is achieved by having the actress laugh as loudly and aggressively as possible for approximately 30 seconds of screen time. After this, Bonnie goes back to the park to meet her friends, and they start talking about games to play. This is where the film introduces Peter Blanc. While Bonnie and her friends are talking, they're interrupted by a voice off screen saying, I know some fun games we can play. The four of them look, and standing underneath the tree is a man. Not an anthropomorphic animal. A man who quickly introduces himself as Peter Blanc. Compared to the other characters in the film, 
Peter both looks and sounds drastically different. He's a tall man dressed in a white button-down shirt and white pants. His hair is brown and his facial features are a lot more defined, especially the eyes, the lips, and the teeth. Like the other characters, he does not blink. But his eyes still clearly seem to move and have more detail to them than the eyes of the other characters. There are clear pupils and irises and even cuticles. Peter is also the only other character besides Bonnie and her family to have teeth, although unlike the distinctive beaver buck teeth they all display, he has a complete set of human teeth. He's not animated any better than the other characters, but his character model clearly looks somewhat more competently made than the others. His movements are still slow and robotic, but unlike with most of the other characters, it almost feels deliberate. Then there's the matter of his voice. He speaks in a low, slow voice, and there's very little distortion or background noise with his dialogue. His delivery is consistently monotone, and that gives an even more eerie feeling. Even the way he introduces himself. I am Peter Blanc. He says it in a way that's almost spaced out and dreamlike. One could almost swear there was some sort of reverb or vocal effect, but if there is, it's remarkably subtle for such a low-budget film. Anyway, Peter continues on by telling the kids, I know a place with fun games to play, if you are interested. And as expected, they are. Peter then moves slightly to show them a house just behind him and moves his arms as if to welcome them inside. The house looks more or less the same as the other blocky half-finished houses in the movie, but has a bright red color to it that stands out even amongst the other houses. The windows on the front are also all black, whereas the windows on the other houses are yellow. This is probably to make it look abandoned and empty compared to the others. Well, of course the kids are just thrilled to go play in an abandoned house with a strange man, and they all go in. Bonnie seems to hesitate, but Bradley the Bull keeps calling her chicken until she does. The camera shows her walking in from the front of the house, and the door closes behind her. You might expect the inside of the house to at least be creepy, but it just looks like a gray version of Bonnie's house. Peter Blanc is standing in the middle of it, and he asks the children what kinds of games they like to play. Marty the Mouse says he wants to play an adventure game to prove that he's the bravest. And Peter suggests that they do something of an endurance test. He shows them this closet and tells them that it's very dark and spooky inside. Well, his actual words are, This is a dark and dreadful place. The bravest would last the longest inside before fear took hold of their trembling heart. Wouldn't you agree, children? The way he says children sent a chill through me all those years ago, and it still does now. Bradley the Bull wants to go in first to prove that he's braver than Marty. So he does, lasts a few seconds, and then runs out screaming. Ronnie the Rhino goes next, but it doesn't last much longer. Bonnie refuses to go at all because she's too scared. The whole scene plays out pretty typically and isn't all that interesting up until Marty goes. He teases the others for not being brave enough to handle the closet and he goes inside and closes the door behind him. The camera then shifts to focus on Peter's face and his unblinking eyes. It stays there for about three minutes, and as it does, you start to hear some noises. First, it's like someone's walking around. I had to pause the movie at this point to make sure that one of my neighbors wasn't making that noise. It was definitely from the movie. After the first minute, you can hear someone trying to open the door. Then you can hear Marty the Mouse's voice. But the voice doesn't sound quite right. He's speaking, but it's muffled. It doesn't really sound like he's doing the bad little kid voice he was doing for Marty earlier. You can actually hear him pounding on the door and starting to scream. Pounding more and more frantically to be let out. But Peter and the other characters just stand there. 
After a few minutes, the screaming stops. Peter starts staring at the door, but he doesn't say anything for a while. When he does, it's got nothing to do with Marty. He just asks, Would any of you like to have a snack with me? Bradley the Bull says yes, and he and Ronnie go off with Peter. Bonnie's the only one that doesn't. She just keeps staring at the door Marty went into with this blank expression on her face. I think the animators were trying to make it seem like she knew something wasn't right. It's hard to say. Eventually, though, she goes and follows the others. The next scene shows Peter at a large table filled with shapes that I assume are meant to be food. They're on textured things that look kind of like roast chicken, grapes, corn, and various things in bowls. But none of the characters actually touch any of them. Peter is instead seen opening a bottle of wine and asking the others if they'd like a drink. Bradley and Ronnie say yes. Bonnie doesn't, but gets wine anyways. Bradley drinks the wine first and asks what they're going to eat, as if there isn't a whole banquet on the table anyways. Peter just says, any volunteers? He then picks up a knife and is seen to be cutting into something, although we aren't immediately shown what. You don't hear the screaming at first. It fades in slowly, but when it does, you can hear that it's a man. The camera pans out to show that Peter's placed Bradley down onto the table and is sawing into him with the knife. The effect isn't all that gory. There is blood all over the table, but it just looks like spots of red Play-Doh were pressed onto the table. It's the screaming that really got me, though. Just like with Marty the Mouse, not even five minutes ago, Bradley's screaming as if he's actually being hurt. You can hear the voice actor trying to speak, and you can hear him actually crying. At one point, he clearly says, Why are you doing this? And, I don't want to die. And, well, it sounds awfully convincing. Bradley and Ronnie both watch as Bradley's taken apart, slice by slice, screaming and crying the whole time. Peter even sets a stake of Bradley in front of both of the girls and says to them, Bon appetit, my friends. Please, eat while it is fresh. Despite literally having just watched her friend get carved into pieces, Ronnie begins to eat, but Bonnie doesn't. She just stares at Bradley with the same awkward silence as before as he screams and screams. It holds on that for a minute or so, until Bradley's screams abruptly cut out and there's nothing but silence. Then after a while, Ronnie asks, Is there a place to sleep? I'm tired. And Peter tells her that there is. It's worth noting that there is clearly meant to be blood around Ronnie's mouth and down the front of her dress. Just like on the table, it looks like red Play-Doh, so the effect doesn't come across as that gory. But the intention is still there. And it's somewhat more effectively sickening on her. Peter takes her by the hand, then offers a hand to Bonnie as well. She takes it as he leads them away to a place where there are two beds side by side. One for Bonnie, the other for Ronnie. He tucks them both in before bidding them good night and leaving. Bonnie closes her eyes to sleep, and while they're closed, you can see an orange glow appear near her face. Her eyes open and she's greeted with what looks like a realistic fire in her room. The fire's already spread far enough to contain Ronnie's bed, and Bonnie stares into it as you see a blackened shape resembling her friend standing inside of it. Just like with her other two friends, you can hear screaming fade in slowly, easily, the most chilling of the three. It sounds as if the actress is really burning alive. There are no words. Just sheer, blood-curdling shrieks of agony. But the most disturbing part is that even though it's clearly Ronnie the Rhino standing in the flames, she doesn't move. 
She doesn't thrash or run. She just stands stock still as she burns. Those haunting screams not matching the unsettling stoicism of her character. Bonnie runs for the door and steps outside. It's hard to make sense of exactly what happens next on account of the movie's poor quality. But as far as I can tell, Bonnie goes out the front door of the gray house and finds herself back inside, as if she'd just walked in. Only now there's no fire, and Peter Blanc is still standing there, looking at her with those unblinking eyes of his. She finally asks him, Why are you doing this? And Peter responds with, Because you have abandoned God. He has abandoned you. As he speaks, you can see the places where Bradley, Marty, and Ronnie meet their fates. The closet door is shaking from where Marty is pounding on it. You can still hear his desperate cries. Bradley's lying on a table, cut in half and hyperventilating. And Ronnie's just standing there, just like she was before, burning alive and screaming. Their screams meld into one horrible sound. As you see Peter standing in front of them, and above the sound of their screams, you can hear his voice as he says, This is where the abandoned go. It's at this point that Bonnie wakes up in her own bed, just like she did at the start of the movie. Her mother comes in, just like before, and tells her that it's time to go to church. Only this time, Bonnie doesn't complain. The final scene of the movie shows Bonnie and her family going to church again. Just like before, she sees her friends playing in the park. But this time, they're not alone. Peter Blanc is there with them, and they're all gathering around him. He looks at Bonnie, and you can hear his voice as he says, You cannot save them. Then, just like that, he and her friends turn to leave. Bonnie does the same, going to church with her parents. And then the credits roll with the same upbeat music the movie started with. When I was a kid, this movie gave me nightmares. And I think it's pretty obvious why. I used to dream about Peter Blanc, standing in my room, with the blood-curdling sounds of screaming echoing in the distance. In my dreams, he always asked me, Are you abandoned? And I'd wake up screaming that I hadn't turned my back on God. Some nights I still find myself checking the corners of the room when I wake up just to make sure that I really am awake and that nothing's there. Rewatching the movie got me thinking about just where it came from, though. What kind of person thought any of this was appropriate for a children's movie? So I did my research. I looked for answers. Whatever answers there were to find out there, at least. There isn't a lot of information on Trinity Pictures Animation. I found a defunct website on an internet archiver that gave some information, but most of it was just semi-informative filler meant to reassure curious parents that they were trusting a man of the true Christian faith to traumatize their children. Despite the fancy name, Trinity Pictures animation really boiled down to just one man, Troy Redman. A resident of Amber, Texas who'd spent six years trying to turn his dreams into a reality. He'd allegedly written and animated Bonnie the Beaver Goes to Church all by himself. Not hard to believe, considering the quality. And based it off both his own religious upbringing and some dreams he'd had as a child that contributed to his own steadfast faith. In his own words on the website, I wanted to bring the same things that cemented my belief in God to other children. I feel like this is the foundation of all my success and it's a lesson I feel that I am called to share. I did a search for anything I could find on Troy Redman to see if I could find out what he'd been up to in the years since he'd made Bonnie the Beaver. There wasn't much. The only thing I turned up was a news report about a suicide at a motel room outside of San Antonio, Texas in April of 2006, later identified as Troy Redman. The picture I found of the man in the article was the same one I found on the defunct site. He killed himself not even a month after Bonnie the Beaver came out. I looked up the cast of the movie next. What I found on some of the other voice actors was... interesting. 
and a little disturbing. When I looked up the people who'd voiced Bradley, Marty, and Ronnie, I didn't find any evidence that they'd ever worked on anything else during their lives. What I did find were a few news articles on each of them. All of them about how they died. Mark Downing, who'd voiced Bradley, had been found stabbed to death in his home in June of 2004. Brian Tuma, who'd voiced Marty, had disappeared in February of 2003, and his remains were later found in 2014. He'd been trapped in the basement of an abandoned building, in a concrete room behind a locked steel door. It's believed that he'd eventually starve to death. Justina Maxwell, who'd voiced Ronnie, had passed away with her husband and two children in an arson case in 2003. She had been tied to her bed when the house had been set alight. No suspects were ever apprehended in any of these three cases. They remain unsolved to this day. I couldn't find anything on the people who voiced Bonnie's parents. Their names were listed, but I couldn't find any evidence that they'd ever voice acted before or since. It made trying to contact them to ask them about the movie basically impossible, assuming they were even still alive. And as for Bonnie the Beaver herself, the girl credited was named Kelsey Cote. I found no information on her, but I can only hope that no news is good news. Somehow, I can't help but doubt that, though. There was no voice actor credited for Peter Blanc, and my research into the movie didn't turn up any names. In fact, outside of the defunct website and some tragic articles that appeared to be about the deaths of those involved, I couldn't find anything about Bonnie the Beaver Goes to Church. Out of desperation, I even posted on some forums hoping that someone else might know something, but most people who responded hadn't heard of it. I only found one person who did, and they only replied to one of my posts before blocking me. Don't ever talk about that movie again. But I have to talk about it, because I have to know what the truth behind Bonnie the Beaver Goes to Church is. I have to know because ever since I rewatched it, I've been having nightmares again. Nightmares where Peter Blanc stands in my room, watching me with his unblinking eyes for what feels like hours on end until eventually he asks me the question I've been dreading. Are you abandoned? It's gotten to the point where some nights I don't sleep at all. But even on those nights, I can still see him in the corner of my room. I can still hear his question, and I swear he's getting closer to me. I need to know that these are just dreams. I need to know that Bonnie the Beaver Goes to Church is just a stupid, dark, ugly movie with a messed up history, trying to cash in on religion. Because if it's not, 